ended where we were talking about the conflict that has arisen between Samaritan and the Jews. And the, it really it started a long, long time. And it seems like there's certain people groups in the world that um, uh, have always had these ongoing conflicts that have a long-standing history. And certainly, uh, one of them is the Jews and the Samaritans, and they were bitter, bitter enemies. And the Samaritan, Samaritans ultimately built a temple of their own with counterfeit priests and unlawful sacrifices. And in Jesus' time, animosity between Jews and Samaritans were especially fierce. And during a public debate with Jesus, a Jewish leader tried to discredit Jesus and insult him as deeply as he could, and he spat out John 8, 48. Then the Jews answered and said to him, do we not say rightly that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Well, we catch the demon part real easy, but we don't realize how insulting that he, they, they meant when he, they referred to Jesus as a Samaritan. So in Jesus' parable, to use a Samaritan, a longtime enemy of the Jews, was quite an example to draw on as what it meant to love your neighbor. And, and I uh, was mentioning to you uh, during the Second World War, um, you know, we fought the Japanese. And at the end of that particular time, uh, General MacArthur had called upon uh, the church in America to actually send mission missionaries over to that particular country. And he had the right view. He had, they were enemies, but now the war was over, and we had a great opportunity to now intervene. We had the same thing that could have taken place in the Civil War in our own country, how the, the North treated the South. and. It's very, very common when you have an enemy, whoever it might be, it could be a next door neighbor, it could be, you know, a Japanese, it could be the South, it could be whatever it happens to be, it could be racial, it could be, you know, you just go on and on and on with all these type of things, to actually apply this principle with this great hate and background that we can see between Samaritans and Jews and put it in place in, in everyday life. Because it really is something that's really applicable for us today. Because there are people that we really don't like. There are people that we would consider to be absolute enemies. And it would have been, it would have been well for us as a country if we would have sent over scads of missionary to, J to Japan when MacArthur asked, but we didn't. And it would, it would have been right for us and good for us and good for the country if we would have treated the South much better than we did as far as the North goes uh, when the Civil War was actually over. Um, it didn't happen. It didn't happen. And it created many, many problems, even to this day. It seems like just some people that are still fighting that war. It's the strangest thing to me. You have people who you know, look to the north or the north look to the south and they have these these bad connotations that, that seem to them for for some reason. They're still hang around. But Luke ten thirty three says, But a certain Samaritan as he journeyed came where he was, and when he saw him he had compassion. Now we're on G in our study, so have so if you have your study sheet, keep following along with that. And it says here, pure and undefiled religion before God did not consist of birthrights and bloodlines or rituals or rote confessions of faith or anything of the sort. Pure religion is something entirely different. James 1.20 said, pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Now, how he loved. Let's pay attention to how the Samaritan actually loved in Luke 10.33. First, he saw him. First, he saw him. The priest and the Levite also saw him, but they showed no love. However, the heretic, the outcast, 
Now, he was moved to compassion. Something in the heart of this Samaritan went out to this bleeding Jew. Mm -hmm. And a sense of sadness, grief, tenderhearted empathy, he saw and embraced the urgent need to rescue and recover this man. So he went to him. So he saw him, then he went to him, verse 34. And the polar opposite of what the priest and the Levite did, and kept in, keep in mind that the injured man had been robbed and had nothing whatsoever. That means what was used came from the Samaritan in caring for this man. So the Samaritan used wine as an antiseptic and oil as a bomb that would sanitize and seal the wound. Now those are old-time medicines. You know, old-time medicines, and sometimes we see the same type of thing uh, when the elders are called, you know, they're, they're actually called uh, when somebody's sick in James, and we mentioned uh, that they're to do what? Anoint with oil. You know, it, it, it's really the same kind of, kind of concept. Uh, it's not a magic formula, it's just the medicine that they had at the time, and that's the medicine that they used. Now this would help prevent infection, and olive oil actually was the chief emollient used as medicine at this time and was effective in bringing relief from stinging pain from uh, the abrasions of bandages. So, you know, if you don't have anything around, what can you use? Why not? Use olive oil. What's wrong with it? Just as good. Sometimes it's just as good. And I tell you what, some of the expenses that people have, you know, you might want to use some of this old stuff. Because <laughs> it works probably just as good as some of the new stuff that costs oodles and oodles and oodles of dollars. This is number, this is D. Jesus is conveying the, the lavish generosity of the Samaritan. And notice, he sent the man on his own animal, which means the Jew rode while the Samaritan walked. He is making extraordinary sacrifices for someone he didn't even know. And he brings him to a wayside inn, gives up his own clothes, supplies, time, a night's sleep, and a significant sum of money. He doesn't hesitate to do everything he can for the Jew. A total stranger, an enemy, he never asked, who is my neighbor? He simply did everything to help a total stranger in a desperate situation. Now, this is so foreign to the general uh, function of people today. It's just foreign. We don't function like this. Christians don't function like this. Nobody functions like this, except for Jesus. Jesus functioned like this. <clears throat> and this is why he chose the Samaritan. Why do you, uh, or what do you do that for someone who is your enemy? What would we do? Would you single-handedly provide for all his needs? I wouldn't. Would you dress his wounds? I'd probably get sick. <laughs> Would you feed him? Maybe. Maybe. Would you stay with him through a long night of pain? Doubt it. Right? I doubt it. Then I doubt it. Would you pay for his bill and provide for several weeks board in a medical care facility? No way. And then leave a blank check to pay everything that he might need in the meantime? Absolutely not. <laughs> actually, there was someone you would, uh, actually, there is someone you would do all these things for, and it would be yourself. <laughs> right? You would do these things for yourself. You would do it for a family member. You would do it for someone you love. I would do this for one of my grandchildren. I would do this for my wife. I doubt if I would do this for someone I can't stand. <laughs> right? That's the way we are. 
But who would do such these things for a stranger and an enemy to boot? And this kind of thinking is simply not done. It's just simply not done. And of course, Jesus is describing a rare love that has no limits and is replying to the lawyer's original question in Luke 10.35. Remember what the question was? Who is my neighbor? You know, that's the question. And Jesus is answering this particular question. But the question was, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? That was the question. Remember what this lawyer asked? What shall I do to inherit eternal life? That was the lawyer's question. So the answer goes like this. What does the law say? What does the law say? Love your neighbor as yourself. Yes. Luke 10, 27. So you've answered rightly. Do this and you will live. Verse 28, 10, 28. So Jesus told the parable of the Good Samaritan in order to show what an impossibly high standard the law sets for us it rebukes not just the lawyer, but all of us. If we always truly loved our neighbor the way we care for ourselves, the Samaritan's generosity would not seem so remarkable. But it is. It's absolutely remarkable. So at the end of the story, Jesus turns to the lawyer with his own question in Luke 10:36. What does Jesus ask? What does Jesus ask in 1036? Which was neighbor? Which of these three is the neighbor? Yeah. Yeah. So the lawyer had only one possible reply. Jesus says, plunging the conviction dagger deep into the man's heart, and he says, go and do likewise and we can't fathom that particular statement you know we we just don't understand the the hatred between a samaritan and a jew we just can't grasp because we don't we don't deal with these things we, we don't have to deal with these things some people do but i never have have you so we don't grasp the immensity of these statements we we miss them how many times have you read this story? How many times have we actually gone through the scriptures, read, read this story, and, and I never give it a thought? You don't give it a thought. But what Jesus is actually driving home and what he's actually saying, and because we don't enter into the historical setting, we don't, we don't see the immensity of these statements. Deuteronomy 27, 26 says, Cursed is the one who does not confirm all the words of this law by observing them. And all the people shall say, Amen. <laughs> Did they realize what they were saying? No. Mm, I don't think so. James 2.10. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. So that's... That's us, right? That's us. We don't realize how guilty we really are. And that's what Jesus was doing to this, this lawyer. And this is what you can do and I can do to every single good person you know. Take them to the law. Take them to the extreme parts of the law. Take them to a Samaritan thing and say, do, do you do this? Have you ever done this? See, the law demands that one love like the Samaritan all the time. Go and do likewise. Should have moved the lawyer to plead for the, and grant, uh, to, to, that Jesus would grant or God would grant nothing but mercy because he had failed miserably. 
Romans 7.10, and the commandment which was to bring life, I found to bring death. And that's what the law does. Now, if anybody could really keep the law, we know that you could get to heaven by keeping the law. And we have a, you know, we have, I think, a general observation of the law that says, oh, yeah, I, I, I don't, I've never done that. I, I've not done that. Uh, maybe I, I haven't done that. But when you start to go through the law and the magnitude of the law and how high it truly is, then we begin to see more and more how much we need the, the mercy and grace of God. You know, if... Um Jesus really honed in on what the intent of the law was when, when uh, he was talking about. It. He said, "You know, have you ever said to your, you know, have you ever called somebody a fool? Then you murdered him in your heart. You know, you may not have killed somebody physically, but he's talking about the intents of your heart and what the the whole idea, what the law was intended to do, was to reveal to you your need." For salvation. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But when you read these things, does it keep you humble? You know, when you honestly read these things, what does it do for you? The difference in Luke 10 between the priest, the Levite, and the Samaritan was the Samaritan had compassion. The other ones didn't. They no. didn't care. No, they didn't care. Mm -hmm. no. They were concerned about themselves. But if I stop for this guy, I might wind up like him. But even if we could say, you know, that, you know, I, I wouldn't be like the priest or I wouldn't be like the Levite, I might lean, that, you know, I might actually lean in some capacity to be like the Samaritan. I would never be like the Samaritan. I, I just never would. Would you say you'd be like a Samaritan? Would you actually do that? The, uh, the word compassion to me is kind of prefix on, in the subject. It means with feeling, compassion. So he wasn't just thinking, he was understanding what this fellow was going through. Yeah, but we can have compassion and still not act like this. Yeah. You know, I, I think I can feel, you know, I could. I can feel my, for my friend Rick Sampson, who's now facing probably death, and his wife, who's already seen a husband pass on through cancer, now have to watch this again. I can have feeling. Mm -hmm. I can feel for her, can't you? You know, we can feel for every single person that we just prayed for today, can't, yes. can't you? Yes. What are you going to do about it? That's a different story. There, there's, there's different. Now, there's some people that can take all these, um, all these prayer requests, you know, and they'll take them home and they will pray for them. Some people will listen to these prayer requests and it goes in one ear and goes out the other and, and it's, they're done. They, they heard it that morning. It's not that they don't have compassion for it. Don't you have compassion for all these people that we just prayed for? I do. But we'll go home and we'll do what? I mean, sometimes, uh, you know, if, uh, if you're like me, sometimes when somebody asks me to pray for them, I pray that moment because I'm going to what? Forget. Yeah, 10 minutes later, it's out of my head. Yes. It's just out of my head. Now, we have prayers that we, that we actually set down, uh, that we used to have a, a prayer meeting on Wednesday. Very few would attend that, but there'd be a few. And we'd always pray for whoever's on, you know, whoever was listed and, and other, uh, other prayer requests. But normally what, what happens is we pray for them. We have compassion for them. It's not that we don't have feeling for them. But there's some people will take it to a different dimension. Now, some people will pray for them. Other people will actually pray for them and send cards to them. Not only will some people send cards to them, they will send direct messages from the Word of God that actually entail something that's an encouragement for them. So they take it, they're trying to minister to them to the best of their ability. Now you can do that from home, you can do that, you know, uh, from wherever you are, but what I'm saying is, I'm a total failure when it comes to the law. You know, and I, I don't, I, I'm not 
I, I just don't measure up, even in the slightest way. Not even the slightest way. And neither do you, right? I mean, when you get right down to it, none of us even come close to fulfilling the law. Not even close. So, yeah, we have feelings. Yeah, we have compassion. And that's all good. That, that's all good. But I'm saying many, many times we function more like the Levite or the priest than we do the Samaritan. And if it was my enemy, somebody who I absolutely disliked from the bottom of my heart, I would never, never, I know me, I would not respond like that unless the Lord clobbered me over the head. <laughs> or I just read the Samaritan, I just read it, and then came across somebody. Because it'd be fresh in my mind. Now, I read the Samaritan, and so it's fresh in my mind, and I might have a little more compassion than I more normally do. But then tomorrow, when I don't read the Samaritan, and it's out of my head, and I'm you know, thinking about something else, and then I run into somebody, I probably won't function like the Samaritan. And, and that's the problem with Christianity, right? That's the problem with us not growing in Christ. You know, that's our problem. Not growing in Christ. We're not like him. And we, we need to grow so that we are more like him. So that we actually do see people and see things in, through the same light that, that Jesus sees things. And when we actually do walk in his presence and we do find that we are letting the word of God dwell in us richly and we really are uh, being filled with the spirit of God. And the presence of Christ is really real for us. It's not something we just talk about. It's really real to us. Then we begin to actually look at people and look at their souls and, you know, see a stranger and say, you know, or, or see this guy that, you know, is sitting on a corner. And, and just not only we have compassion for him, maybe I'll take him a sandwich. But, you know, maybe I'll get home and I'll just pray for that guy. You know, because we just see people differently. We just totally see them differently. You had something, Gene, you wanted to share? Well, I was a very introverted person. Uh, and my buds used to call me stone face. <laughs> when I met Jesus, he took out that stony heart. It gave me a heart of flesh. And I pray that it happens to you all as well. Yeah, yeah, he, he does change us. But we do need to just simply grow. Because I know my flesh, I know the way I yeah. am. Mm -hmm. and, and when I face things like what we're reading, what we've been looking at in the Samaritan, I just fall flat on my face and say, God, you know, help me grow. Help me have your compassion. Help me see things differently. Matt? Yeah, I just... <laughs> Thinking about how far I am from it, I was reading in Luke further on in 14 where Jesus is talking about the cost of discipleship in verse 33, so therefore any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. And thinking about my daily activities, even with people I know, how I don't even think about them. So, how far I am from <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, it's amazing. Uh, you know, I, I hate to uh, look at the law sometimes because I just say, oh my, or I, I am just, I am so far from this. But one of those real challenging passages to me is Matthew 5, 48. It says, therefore, you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. <laughs> what? <laughs> You know, do you realize how challenging that one verse is? And, and I said, God, I, I just need your grace. I need your mercy. I, I just need the Spirit of God to create in me uh, so much that I don't really have. I, I know the way I function. I know the way I think. I know that many times the Word of God really does so affect me that it, it does change the way I would react 
and actually perceive and actually function. There are times where the Word of God is not in my head at all. Right? It's just not my head at all. I am not functioning right at all. I'm just functioning in the flesh. Christians are very good at just like being just like everybody else in the world. And this is where we have, uh, this is where our challenge is. To not just look and function and act and react like everybody else in the world who's lost. Um, we have a different way of looking at things and we should. And it's a challenge. It's just really, really a challenge. So the truth is that even Christians whose heart has had the love of God poured into it, Romans 5.5, 5, and we have, yes. we have, do not consistently love like the law demands. That's where we are. But the deeper lesson here is the way the Good Samaritan cared for the traveler in the way God loved sinners. In fact, God's love is infinitely more profound and amazing than even the Samaritan. Romans 5, 6 through 8. For when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. How many times have we read that one? Mm -hmm. Do you see the amazing significance of that particular statement that, that God has made? So the Samaritan sacrifices time and his money. God sacrificed his son. Is there a difference there? You might get me to sacrifice my time and my money, but I'm not going to sacrifice my grandchildren or my son. Are you? And that's the, that's the difference. That's the vastness of, of comparing a Samaritan to what, what God actually did. So Jesus is the living embodiment of divine love in all its perfection. In all of its perfection. Now, if that lawyer had only confessed his own guilt and admitted his inability to do what the law actually demands, Jesus was then ready to offer him an eternity of mercy, grace, forgiveness, and true love. Salvation was right at the door for this guy. Right at the door. John 5, 24. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent him has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. Now, can you imagine Jesus, you know, with a person who's led a good life, a good person, what we consider a good person, actually coming and standing before him, and Jesus said, I never knew you. I never knew you. And hell is your home. Bye. How is Jesus going to be able to do that? Well, I'm sure it breaks his heart, but he's going to do it. With a good person. With a good person. Because there's nobody good. Because when you look at the law, man, when you really look at the law, you say... There, there isn't anyone that comes close to this. There isn't a soul that even inches close to this. There is none righteous, no one else. We don't realize how strong that statement is. We just really don't realize. And even as believers, sometimes we don't realize how strong that statement is. How unrighteous we truly are. That is just absolutely astounding sometimes. When you think about what the law demands, what the law says, what God has now placed before that. And so when a good person goes before God, you know, and they don't measure up to the law's demands, 
and they have not received God's forgiveness, God's grace, God's mercy, and they're depending on their goodness, they're in big trouble. They don't stand a chance. Matter of fact, I don't even know, you know, they immediately go to hell. It's the holding tank to actually get your eternal sentence. So you go to hell being a good person, really good person, thinking that you have lived a good, righteous life. And there's so many people that are in that particular state of mind. And they don't realize when they actually face God what he has in his mind as far as what's really good. Because the law will spell out what's good, what's perfect, what's right, and to what degree that actually brings his righteousness to. And that's where we don't have a concept. I don't have a concept. And that's why over and over again, you know, I can wake up and I just simply say, thank God for the grace that you have provided me. That, that's what I do. Thank God that you have provided me grace and mercy and you have been my substitute. So we can continue just to love Jesus so much, so great, uh, because of his amazing sacrifice. We just don't realize how much we need him because when you face what the law demands, we are in a bad state. We don't even realize how bad a state we are in. So the point here, Jesus never made this promise to the smug, self-righteous self, uh, self lawyer as far as salvation goes, nor the rich young ruler. Jesus answered their question by confronting them with the law's demands. But for those who had ears to hear, he constantly made it perfectly clear that eternal life is not earned through legal merit. Rather, it is the gracious inheritance of all who truly put their faith in Christ. Did the man embrace the lesson Jesus was teaching him? Did this lawyer embrace this whole parable? They probably want a way of going, how can you even compare me to a Samaritan? Yeah. Yeah. No. No. This man, did this man confess his inability to do what Jesus told him and go and do likewise? <laughs> did he acknowledge his need for grace and repent? Publicly disgraced in his failed attempt to win a verbal sparring match with Jesus, the anonymous lawyer simply disappeared from the narrative and never is heard from again. <laughs> now, many people like him are oblivious to what the righteousness of God really demands of them. Romans 10.3, many read this parable of the Good Samaritan as if it were nothing more than a mandate for humanitarianism. And that's what many people get out of the parable. If after reading this parable, people would actually move toward this perfect love for their neighbor, great. But if that is their only response to this parable, it is a horrible response to have the lesson Jesus was trying to teach. And they miss it. They miss it. And that's what's happened to the parable. The parable is basically used over and over and over again as something humanitarian. That's not what Jesus intended. That, that's not what he was doing. So this parable is meant to convict us to confess our sinful lack of compassion and sacrificial love and seek grace and mercy by turning with repentant faith to Jesus Christ, the only one who truly and perfectly fulfilled what the law demands of us. Hebrews 7.25, Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. So we close with this. If the lawyer had truly looked into the law of God, and recognize his sin rather than turning away, and immediately forgetting what kind of man he was, 
James 1.24. You look into the mirror and immediately turn away, right? Boy, that happened to me. He would have found a savior whose yoke was easy and whose burden is light. And unfortunately, the story ends like so many without a hint of repentance or faith, which was the only right response to this parable. The lawyer missed it, and many, many who present the parable miss it, and we don't want to miss it, what this parable was really about. Okay, so we studied through this one. That's all that we have as far as this particular parable on the good side.